My subject is uh, the quantum two-slit experiment, uh, physical reality and free will. You know, the two-slit experiment is the quintessential, uh, quintessential, quintessential uh, quantum experiment. The, um, it shows all, you know, you can do it right in a lecture room and it shows all of the baffling mysteries of quantum mechanics. And I'll present a version of it that's somewhat different that emphasizes the baffling aspect. But every aspect that I talk about is completely doable and everything I say experimentally is absolutely undisputed. All physicists would agree on the, the experiment that I describe. The, uh, and one essential point is that the quantum experiment arises from I mean, the enigma, the problem, arises because the experimenter assumes that he could freely choose. He has free will. He could freely choose the actual form of the experiment he does. Now, just something about quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is a theory about the here and now, and it's intimately involved with with you, with our consciousness. The um, just to uh, establish what I'm saying. Most of you who know Richard Feynman, Richard Feynman wrote that uh, the two-slit experiment contains the only mystery. We cannot make the mystery go away by explaining how it works. And I will not make the mystery go away by explaining how it works. I'll explain what you will observe, but uh, you'll see that you find there to be a mystery. And it's the qu basic quantum mystery. Uh, quantum theory is the most battle-tested theory in all of science. It presumably applies to everything. Uh, it applies to electrons and atoms and uh, even to the whole universe. Uh, Wheeler and DeWitt have written an equation describing the whole universe in its early stages. Um, for practical reasons, the experiments I'm going to talk about, the two-slit experiment, is uh, limited to small things. Uh, let's see. Um, it's, in classroom, we do experiments with photons and demonstrate it with photons. Uh, actually, for about $5,000, we have one uh, at UCSC, a demonstration that we can move into the room and demonstrate uh, the quantum enigma with electrons. It's a little harder, we don't do it at UCSC, to, dem to demonstrate it with whole atoms. It's also been demonstrated with buckyballs uh, and, and even much bigger molecules, molecules containing 450 atoms. Um, they're setting up, Zeilinger is setting up to do it with live viruses. You know, when you see the experiment, you'll realize that they're putting these things in two places at once, a live virus in two places at once. And he says if he could do it with a virus, he's going to try it with... Uh, a tardigrade. A tardigrade is a little, is also called a water bear. It's a little animal about a millimeter in diameter. Uh, you know, it has legs and nose and all that. You can see it under a magnifying glass. Uh, when Zeilinger, who has done some of these experiments, was asked, you know, what's the limit? How big can you get? And he said, what's the limit? Only budget. Uh, so, 
in our discussions, it, it could be done with all sorts of things. We'll just talk about objects, just to be neutral, objects. Okay? Hey, when I talk about objects, be open-minded about what an object is, what an unobserved object is. Is it uh, a hard little ball like a marble? Or is it uh, a spread out, mushy thing, the visible thing like a cloud ball? Be open-minded. It's hard, but be open-minded. Object. OK. Uh, the, uh, you are given uh, a demonstrator, someone who's going to prove to you uh, an, an enigmatic thing. You are given a large set of pairs of boxes, a large set of box pairs. Okay? You're going to do the experiment now. Uh, you now, you're told, and you obey, you are told to open a hole, a slit, in each box, the two-slit experiment. You're told to, to open a slit in each box, and hey, watch where the object, which box the object came out of. Here's your eye, and here's your other eye, or some kind of a detector. And you always see, you, uh, the, you always see the object came out of one box or the other. One box or the other. Repeatedly, every time, uh, uh, one box or the other. Uh, so therefore, you establish that uh, the object was in one box or the other. And uh, you establish that uh, there's a funny light on this. Uh, you establish that uh, the whole object had been in one box or the other. I mean, if you see it coming out of one box or the other, and you see that the other box is totally empty, then you know that the object had been in one box or the other. I pause. Right? Accept that as evidence? Yes. Good. The, uh, and you did what you were told. Now you are t given a new set of, of box pairs. And uh, you are told again to open a, uh, a slit in each pair, each box of a pair, one at a time. And you're told, don't look. Don't look. OK? You obey. You do what you're told. Don't look. And uh, the, uh, what, what you find, though, you don't see the object coming out of uh, a pair of uh, a box, but you uh, find that the objects impact on a screen. And uh, oh, I should back up a little bit. The, uh, in the first case, when you were told, look, uh, you saw the object coming out of, out, of the, out of the box, but you also had a screen and you saw the objects landed in this sort of random pattern. OK? I like people who nod. Uh, <laughs> it's always good for a lecturer. Uh, OK. Uh, in the next case, you're given a different set of box pairs. And you're told uh, not to look. Don't look. And uh, you don't look. and but you find that the objects came and they landed on, uh, on the screen. Uh, and hey, they landed in a pattern. Some places the objects landed, some places no objects landed. The, uh, what you establish is that each object obeyed a rule, a rule telling it where it could land. Okay? And here it's, here's a side view of that pattern. You do another experiment with that same set of box, uh, with, a, with, a, with a, another set of box pairs, actually three sets of box pairs, and you separate the, uh, one set, one distance, and you separate a different set, a different distance. And what you find, what you find is that the pattern depends on the spacing of the box pairs. When the box pairs were close together, the pattern is, is t uh, far apart. The pattern is tight. 
when the box pairs were close together, the pattern is loose, separated. Hey, the, e each object obeyed a rule telling it where it could land on that screen when you didn't look. And uh, hey, now you have established that the rule depended on the separation of the box pairs. Somehow, each and every object, whoops, each and every object knew the position of its box pair. Somehow knew. So, therefore, doing what you were told, you established that uh, for some box pair sets, each box, each object had been wholly in a single box. Hey, but for other box pair sets, you established by your experiment, when you were told not to look, that for those box pair sets, the objects were not wholly in a, a single box of the pair. Hey, there's a difference, right? The object is either wholly in a single box of its pair or the object is not wholly in a single box of a pair. It's in two places at once, okay? Your choice, your choice. Hey, no problem, no problem. Uh, maybe that's probably how the box pairs were prepared. Some box pair sets had objects that were wholly in a single box. Some box pair sets had objects that were distributed over both boxes. Fine, right? But for the next set of box pairs, you are told to choose, freely choose what to establish. And you find that you can establish either of two contradictory pairs. If you choose that first experiment, the look experiment, you establish that that set of box pairs contained an object wholly in a single box. If you choose the other experiment, you establish a contradictory result. Your choice. Um, well, hey, what was the actual physical situation before you even chose? Well, here are the experimental facts that you established that, uh, hey, these are undisputed experiments. Undisputed experiments. These are things we teach in physics, physics courses all the time. <clears throat> the experimental facts are, hey, either there was no physical reality to the unobserved objects, or uh, your supposedly free choice of what to observe is actually determined by the prior physical reality, by what was actually in the box pairs made you choose the appropriate experiment. Well, quantum theory rejects this. This is quantum theory. Quantum theory says that uh, <clears throat> that there is no physical reality to the unobserved property of something. And uh, it, re it rejects this. N this is no free choice, is rejected. And of course, I believe in free choice and uh, Isaac Belfajar, Singer has said, you have to believe in free choice. You have to believe in free will. You have no choice. What quantum, so hey, that's, that's the experiment. It's an undisputed experiment that happens. Now, what does quantum theory actually say about this? Quantum theory says that observation, I put that in quotes, observation does not only disturb what is to be measured, observations produce what is to be measured. And that's called the Copenhagen Interpretation. And um, that's a quote out of the senior textbook that uh, we teach quantum mechanics from. It's a quote of one of the founders of quantum mechanics, Pascal Jordan. The, uh, the object 
was observed, before the object was observed, quantum mechanics says, it was in a superposition state in both boxes at the same time. Choosing a look experiment, observation randomly collapses the superposition state into an object that had been wholly in a single box. Uh, choosing a don't look experiment collapses the wave function into an object that had been not wholly in a single box, two places at once. Uh, that's what does raise the question, uh, what was there before you looked? Well, observation creates the reality. Um, um, quantum theory is essentially the Schrodinger equation. The, uh, but Schrodinger himself, Erwin Schrodinger, saw a, uh, a problem with conscious observation. In principle, and in principle, quant quantum theory applies to the large things as well as the small. It, we've demonstrated for electrons, atoms, and uh, even big molecules, and they're starting to do experiments with live viruses and tardigrades, which are little one millimeter animals. And um, the, um, but Schrodinger saw a problem with observation. In principle, uh, a Geiger counter, for example, that is isolated and unobserved is just a collection of atoms, isn't it? There's nothing mystical about a Geiger counter. Therefore, if a Geiger counter is hit by an atom, it uh, fires, but if the atom both hit it and didn't hit it, the Geiger counter goes into a superposition state of fired and fired, fired and not fired. This is something we can't do, but quantum theory says it happens. It would, ha it would happen if we could isolate a Geiger counter. Um, consider Schrodinger's cat in, famous cat in the box story. And here's a picture of it, and um, it, oops, yeah. It actually uh, shows how we prepared the objects, the box pairs. What we did was we sent the objects in, they hit sort of a tra semi-transparent mirror, they either went through or bounced off, and either went into the top box or the bottom box. You know, we're thinking quantum mechanically, that thing is a cloudy wave thing. And, but hey, in the bottom box, in this case, in Schrodinger's case, he had a Geiger counter, which opens, would, if an atom comes into that box, would open a, a bottle of poison gas, and there's a cat and the cat would die if the atom came into this box, the cat would not die if it came into this box. But quantum mechanics can demonstrate that before you observed, the atom was in two places at once. It was in both boxes. Therefore, quantum mechanics is saying the cat is simultaneously alive and dead. And, uh, Quantum theory, before you look, says the cat is in a superposition state, both alive and dead. But we know that on looking, you see either an alive or dead cat. Somehow, in a way not explained by quantum theory, conscious, I put conscious in quotes, because I don't know what it is. But observation collapses the superposition state. Hey, it can get worse. Consider that the atom entered the box eight hours ago. In that case, you will find either uh, you become aware of a, a hungry cat or a cat in rigor mortis. Quantum mechanics says you create the history. And there have been experiments demonstrating that, not with cats. Schrodinger's point was, even though it's a result of his equation, uh, he says, absurd. And, but it is what quantum theory says. And, uh, 
and it's been demonstrated with increasingly large objects, not close to cats, but big, big molecules. Hey, if you find the cat dead, are you guilty of killing the cat? No, it's random. You, this is an important point. You can choose the game, but you can't choose the outcome. But you can choose the game. Uh, we can think about that later. But observation produces the outcome. Strange. What does the strangeness mean? What does the strange, what does it mean to you? Hey, it's controversial. And uh, the, uh, here's uh, a statement that I like. It's in our book that uh, the literature, uh, let's see, the literature of the meaning of quantum theory is famously contentious and obscure. And you probably have heard that right here. Uh, and it will remain so until someone constructs within the formalism of quantum theory an observer, whatever that is, that is a model entity whose states correspond to, recognize, to a recognizable caricature of conscious awareness. And that's Frank Wilczek, who won the Nobel Prize a few years ago, physics Nobel Prize. Hey, examples of contention, uh, they range. Uh, Tom Banks, who's an eminent string theorist, uh, writes, there have been clear mathematical arguments given which show that macroscopic arguments obey the rules of classical probability theory. There is nothing more mysterious in quantum mechanics than that, period. Uh, N.G. Van Kampen, a well-known Dutch physicist, quantum mechanics provides a complete and adequate description of observed physical phenomena on the atomic scale. What else can you want? Andre Lindy, professor at uh, Stanford and a very eminent quantum cosmologist, writes, will it, uh, will it, not, will it not turn out with the further development of science that the study of the universe and the study of consciousness will be inseparably linked and that ultimate progress in the one will be impossible without progress in the other. The, or John Bell, uh, the most famous, well, probably the, the leading theorist of the latter half of the 20th century, leading quantum theorist, writes, it is likely that the new way of seeing things will astonish us. We don't have the new way of seeing things yet. Okay, I said, so, Dr. Rosenblum, can you just come here for a second? So I have one or two questions and a couple of observations. Uh, I don't know how many of the people in this community or even in the physics community are aware of the dialogues that uh, the Indian philosopher J. Krishnamurti had with David Baum. Um, and, and, you know, one of the points that Krishnamurti always raised in those dialogues, which was utterly baffling to most people. And he was actually articulating something which is, comes from ancient Vedic wisdom tradition. And he said it in one sentence. He said, the observer is the observed. He kept saying that over and over. In fact, that's what he was known for. The observer is the observed. I think the problem we have, why we have an enigma, is that at least most scientists assume that the observer is somehow separate from that which is being observed, which is in a way strange, because both the observer and the observed are an integrated activity of a whole universe. You are an activity of the universe, and that which you're observing is also an activity of the universe. And it's a single activity. Schrodinger's equation 
ultimately ends up predicting every element in the periodic table, right? And this is probably the most successful equation, even more so, I think, than Einstein's equation. And Einstein also had a problem with this whole uh, enigma thing. But if we assume that the subject-object split is artificial, that nature or the cosmos is a single reality, then there's no enigma. Well, <laughs> I find that puzzling, uh, and puzzlement is an enigma, so whether it's enigmatic is certainly in the eye of the beholder. Uh, I think I know people who would find it enig enigmatic, uh, and if that Schrodinger was a Vedantist. Is that the same thing? As, uh, Schrodinger was a Vedantist, and you quoted Andre Linde, yes. uh, who Joel also quotes um, in his book uh, when he talks about eternal inflation, and he's a student of Vedanta as well. That I didn't know, but I, I certainly, if, if you accept Vedant, I don't know how to say it, but Vedanta, mm -hmm. if you accept it as, I guess you don't see a problem. The, I think most of us, I think, in Western culture, see that as enigmatic. I see. But just asking a question of you right now, do you think that the assumption of science, that the observer is somehow outside the universe, observing it independently, is that a good assumption or is not the observer an activity also of the universe? I like to stick to experiments that are undisputed and just accept that people have other opinions, which I show, and, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Saturday, I might be more sympathetic with a Vedantist approach and Tuesday, Thursday, but Friday. Your experiment then suggests that the the electron or the photon or the or the or the, or the atom, atom or virus knows that it's being watched. I don't know what it means to say an atom knows. Well, because it chooses its behavior yeah. on whether it's being watched or not. I can't deny that, but I find that very puzzling. Okay, thank you, sir.